It is a world in which powerful beings and humans coexist with each other. Here is the possession of a powerful and rare beast. It means that they are all able to command the elements, and their power can lead the world to destruction. The one who is on top of the world is a young man named Su Liang. Since his beast is the moon butterfly Morpho, she is the rarest beast that exists only in legends, which is able not only to manipulate the space-time dimension, but also possesses immortality. What is even more remarkable is the crescent moons in his eyes, shining with a dazzling light. The love, affection, and favor of the moon god are all reflected in his eyes. Thanks to the legend of a powerful beast and a specific appearance, he managed to rise to the top of the world and acquire millions of loyal followers. After carefully seeing the face on the monitor and thinking a little, he discovered something very interesting information about the moon god. The fact that he is very similar to him. And even more, the fact that he is the moon king named Su Liang. Yes, this young man is Su Liang. A few hours ago, he was transported from the earth of the 21 century to the world of animal tamers, and at the same time received fragments of the memories of the former owner of this body. It all happened because the strong and invincible Moon King accidentally fell out of bed while sleeping and hit his head on the floor to death. If he had just moved into this world now, he would certainly consider what had happened a great success. That's just the status of Sue Lion was completely fictional. Among other things, all his achievements also turned out to be a complete lie. Namely, according to his false data, he, at the age of 14 he awakened the companion beast. At the age of 15 he acquired the title of Moon King. At 16 he founded the Twin Moons, in which millions of followers revere him as the head of the teaching. At the age of 17, on the eve of receiving his degree, the Lord of the Cold Moon declared war on him, in which the decisive battle will take place in three years. In fact, the original owner did not lie to anyone, since he really considered himself strong. He also firmly believed that his shimmering butterfly was the reincarnation of a divine beast that would manifest its true form when faced with a deadly threat. The coming will happen, you just need to believe. It was a favorite phrase from the collection of the Moon King. Even when he came face to face with the Lord of the Cold Moon, the eight-star beast tamer, he did not show a single drop of fear. The guy who moved into Su Lion's body wonders where he got so much self-confidence from. The guy proclaims that if he had not familiarized himself with his character, perhaps he would have believed in this nonsense about himself. He intends to see what his beast is like and calls his shimmering butterfly. A beautiful shimmering blue butterfly is coming. Su Liang is touched by him, but sees that she is too small and small for battles. That's why it turns out to be completely useless against the upcoming battles. He wonders what he should do next and that in three years he will have a duel with the Lord of the Cold Moon, against which he will not be able to resist. He assumes that if he does not have some kind of cheat trick like the Golden Finger, then surpassing the Lord of the Cold Moon will be something out of the realm of fiction. Suddenly he remembers that he has an ability like the Golden Finger. In the deep memories of the former owner, a mystical object is mentioned. It is unknown where it came from, but the strange thing is that the original owner decided to completely ignore it. This sacred object is the Book of the Moon. Su Liang immediately activates it, and the very next second it appears in his arms. Opening the book, Su Liang sees that it is an illustrated reference book. On the edge of each page of the handbook there was a warning about which animal belongs to which rank. Touching the handbook, Su Liang concluded that it would activate if you touch the real beasts mentioned in it. Just like in some game, having accumulated a sufficient number of points, the reference book can grant a beast of indeterminate rank by lottery. Opening a couple of pages, Su Liang sees that there is nothing in the place where there should have been images of the moon butterfly Morpho. He understands why the original owner rejected this book, because she denied what he firmly believed, namely, in possession of the moon butterfly Morpho. He is not surprised by this outcome of events. Having decided not to give up in the initial situation, he comes up with a new plan. Su Liang thinks that since he is in the Moon Beast Academies, there are plenty of them in this place. So he gets ready and goes outside with the intention of touching them. He proclaims that it would be nice if he accumulated 10 attempts to use them at once. Su Liang even hopes that he will pull out the Moon Butterfly. Morpho, in his thoughts, he concludes that it is too early for him to think about the battles that awaits him in three years. First of all, he decides that he needs to become as strong as possible. He comes to the conclusion that until this happens, no one will reveal him. Meanwhile, in the elite dormitory of the Moonbeast Taming Academies, a girl named Bai Yuer feeds small animals. Her disgruntled friend named Su Jing irritably proclaims that Bai Yuer is feeding these low-ranking animals all the time. She discontentedly asks her what she will do if they eventually get attached to her. Bai Yuer begins to reassure her friend, saying that she, of course, will not enter into a contract with a moon rabbit or other low-ranking animal. 
Bai Yue proclaims that she is just playing with them. Su Jing is even more furious. She reminds Bai Yue that she is a representative of the elite academies. The girl says that if she spends too much time playing and spending with low-ranked animals, she will eventually become unable to attract more powerful beasts. Su Jing proclaims that the Moon King would never touch an ordinary beast. She exclaims that, not to mention a small fish of medium and high rank, it is not a fact that, passing by a beast of the highest rank, he will deign to look at it. Su Jing says that she is sure that the Moon King Butterfly can't stand the smell of insignificant creatures. Bai Yuer is a little discouraged and lowers his eyes. A few seconds later, looking up, they see the Moon King himself in front of them. When they see him, they both freeze in anticipation of his further actions. Both girls simultaneously think that one glance is enough to desire a guy and completely obey him. Su Liang, without making unnecessary movements, recalls that the Moon King is famous for avoiding contact with animals and not touching them once again. He comes to the conclusion that it would still be better for him to get away from this place and as soon as possible. He leaves, and the girls remain in place with anxious faces. Su Liang comes to the Moonlight Pavilion and sees an open moon over a beautiful garden. He walks past them and intends to enter the main building. He comes to the conclusion that given the number of low-ranked beasts that inhabit the pavilion, he comes to the conclusion that if he manages to unlock them all, then he will surely be able to carry out at least one extraction. Waiting for new discoveries, Su Liang solemnly enters the Moonlight Pavilion. Entering the building, he sees small twinkling lights in front of him, reminding him of fireflies. Touching one of them, he unlocks a new beast. The number of highlighted illustrations in Su Lian's reference book is increasing. Touching a couple more low-ranked beasts, he sees that their names are displayed in their place, as well as themselves. Su Liang comes to the conclusion that the Book of the Moon, among other things, displays information about specific beasts and their combat skills. He proclaims that he expects this from the Golden Finger. Walking a little through the building, he sees a huge door located right in the middle of the building. He notices that this place is very deserted and that low-ranked animals also do not approach this door. Even before opening the door, he assumes that there are possessions of a medium rank beast here. However, after opening the door, the guy notices a huge room in front of him, in the middle of which there is a bed with a white doe. Approaching a little, he notices a record with information about the beast in front of him. The plaque says that it is a snow white fallow deer, which is a medium rank moon type beast. She turns out to be one of the most beautiful and rare representatives of the middle rank. Has a meek character, he likes to eat grass and bathe in the rays of moonlight. Due to the specific feature, which consists in extreme discrimination when choosing a partner, today the number of representatives of the species has become extremely small, small. At the moment, only the palace of the moon god still has the basis for the cultivation and breeding of pure-blooded snow-white fallow deer. Looking at the deer, and then at the sign with a long inscription, he wonders, why is such a huge inscription allocated to an ordinary animal? At this moment, two more students enter the room. One of them wonders why the academy means so much money for the maintenance of the lunar pavilion if its attendance is free. He also asks his friend about why it takes so much money to maintain one medium-ranked beast. The guy proclaims that he has never seen such a beast, which is given as much attention as this one. The second student replies that perhaps it's her attractiveness index and that looking at her beauty, there are a lot of interesting and unscrupulous thoughts. Su Liang and the middle rank do notice their conversation. The second student begins to talk about the snow white deer, bad things and that rich people are fond of such animals. Just as he proudly finishes his speech, a huge pile of water flies on his head. The student standing next to him is taken aback by surprise, begins to avoid the second. They both look up into their eyes, after which they see an angry doe in front of them. The first student wonders if the beast really understood their language. The second one answers that, perhaps, the animals of the middle rank have those who have high intelligence. Deeming it necessary to find out, despite the back, they both hurriedly run out of the building. After seeing this incident, Su Liang thinks that this medium-ranked beast really looks amazing. To some extent, he understands those two students. At this very moment, the deer looks up and sees a guy in front of him. Looking at his eyes, she notices something special about them. The doe brings its gaze closer to his face. And at the same moment, Su Lion has the Book of the Moon in his hands. An inscription appears on it about unlocking a new beast. And the same number of highlighted illustrations in the directory increases. This beast turns out to be an intelligent hunter of the highest rank of the lunar type. Gaping, the guy does not understand what is happening at this moment. 
At this moment, it dawns on him that this is not some spotted deer, but the highest beast that can destroy cities and sweep away countries. A beast of the highest rank, the embodiment of greatness. It is a being who commands myriads of beasts. The mere manifestation of his overwhelming aura is enough to kill new creatures in the area. And if the beast gets angry, then it will all be leveled to the ground within a radius of several hundred kilometers. Su Liang wonders why such a nuclear bomb is kept within the walls of the academy. At this moment, he realizes that the academy can fly into the air at any moment because of one animal. He concludes that he needs to calm down since the beast has decided to lead such a quiet life. The guy assumes that she has a meek character and wonders if the academy knows that she will not harm people so easily. He thinks that otherwise those two students would not have gotten off in such an easy way. However, he suggests that she may be lying in order to appear stronger, like the heroes from the novella who hide their powers, in order to show off after. Su Liang sees that his situation is really dire, since he has neither the strength nor the helpers, and at that moment he comes to the conclusion that only his reputation will save him. When a guy stands near the sign, a doe approaches him. After waiting, she begins to read what is written on the sign. And at this moment, the guy thinks that she may realize that there is not quite the truth written in this tablet. Suddenly, the doe turns to the guy and makes a fierce look. She gets into an attacking pose and points her horns towards Su Lian. Su Liang realizes that she is going to attack. He starts to panic mentally. The guy wonders if she really realized that he had found out her secret. Su Liang still doesn't show it. He comes to the conclusion that it is not worth panicking and not making a fuss once again, so as not to scare her away and so he decides to take the situation into his own hands. It includes improvisation. At this moment, he calmly turns around and pretends that he was just staring at a beautiful snow-white deer, which, of course, he says out loud. The guy turns around and looks very serious, but with anxious thoughts is about to leave the door. He doesn't care what thoughts she was going to attack him with. He just intends to leave unharmed, and therefore decides to just play along with her. Su Liang decides to pretend to be an aesthete, and then safely leave. Then, of course, he does after that. Immediately after his departure, the doe begins to wonder about his eyes. Still unable to stand it, she goes to her bed, which is located right in the middle of the room. The deer pulls out a phone from under the pillow and starts looking for information about what patterns were in front of the guy. Opening the search engine, she sees that it is none other than the king of the moon. The doe freezes on the spot from shock and surprise. From the search results, she is thrilled on the spot. Su Liang hurriedly arrives at the academy's dormitory area. The guy comes to the conclusion that someone has them all right in the head, since they keep such a dangerous beast at home. Again, he thinks it's like putting a Tyrannosaurus in a zoo. However, he thinks that, despite her fragile appearance, she herself can trample several Tyrannosaurs with one foot. Su Liang thinks he is very lucky, since if he had met her in some wilds, his life would definitely have come to an end. The guy thinks that in the end, only a beast of a high rank can be compared to a beast, also of a high rank. Speaking of animals, he remembers that while he was in the Moonlight Pavilion, his reference book displayed not only the name and category of the beasts, but also their fighting skills. Consequently, he comes to the conclusion that he can find out everything about the beast with which he comes into contact. He begins to rejoice at his so small and at the same time big find. The guy immediately starts looking for some low-ranking animal nearby in order to confirm whether his words are true. After looking around a little and looking closely, he notices a small moon rabbit, whom he had met before in the company of two girls. Su Liang approaches like a rabbit and sees that he is behaving very strangely. According to the setting of this world, being under the moonlight, all animals of the lunar type have big changes in character. Namely, they become hot-tempered and violent. Of course, combat capability and physical indicators are also growing. He wonders why this rabbit looks so harmless and why it doesn't react to the moon. Suddenly he remembers that situation with the deer and jumps back sharply. He thinks that this time the rabbit may be strong and hides his abilities under the mask of a defenseless and cute rabbit. Su Liang does not rule out the possibility that he has met a big boss who will give odds to the animals of the highest rank. Having made an innocent face, the guy begins to stretch his arms to the rabbit. How does he intend to find out with his reference book what his rank is? The directory gives out that it is a moon rabbit, having the essence of the waning moon. The essence of the waning moon is a genetic defect caused by an innate weakness of the body, due to which there is no opportunity to intensify at night, absorbing moonlight. The owner of the essence of the waning moon can gain combat capability only on the night of the full moon. 
Su Liang is numb with shock and surprise. He realizes that this beast is even worse than low-ranking beasts. The guy is immediately disappointed and proclaims that it is destined to bypass luck forever. At this moment, Su Liang notices some rustling in the bushes. He does not pay attention to this and continues stroking the rabbit on the head. This rustle was reproduced by Bai Yuer, who came to feed the rabbit. When she sees that the king of the moon is nursing a rabbit, she immediately begins to be touched and delighted that she even drops her phone and food from her hands. She comes to the conclusion that she accidentally revealed the secret of the moon king, that he actually likes cute things. Full of thoughts, the girl comes to her room, where Su Jing notices her floating in the clouds. She asks Bai Yu about where she has been all this time. In response, there is a question about whether it is possible, which is purely hypothetical, that the Moon King likes all sorts of cute things and animals. Still with the same cold and irritated tone, the neighbor answers her that it is possible. Bai Yuer needs to take a day off, since she's talking such, frankly, nonsense. Under the pretext of a joke, Bai Yuer retires to his room. She wonders if only she knows about such a side. His Majesty the Moon King. At this moment, Su Liang also comes to his room and thinks that even though someone witnessed the scene, his deviation from the carefully created image, he actually doesn't care. After thinking it over carefully, now it seems to him that it turned out to be a pretty good mo, built on contrast. He suggests that surely girls who read novels about the love of tyrants like such twists. Therefore, he decides not to worry about it at all. Having suffered all day, the only thing he thinks about and will be able to think about is how to go to bed as soon as possible. Opening the door of his room, suddenly he notices a silhouette near his window. He notices a girl with a physique that can't possibly belong to a person. He assumes that it is a humanoid beast. She notices him and starts approaching him. As he approaches, the guy feels these oppressive sensations and an aura even stronger than the one that emanated from the moon huntress. This terrifying aura surpasses all imaginable limits. The guy is so scared that he can't move a finger. However, he doesn't show it. A sudden girl kneels down and respectfully greets the moon king. After thinking for a second, he remembers the girl. Judging by the memories of the former owner, he suggests that this girl may be one of the beasts of the four phases of the Twin Moon's teachings. However, he can't remember which one it is. There is a very awkward silence between them for a moment. The girl at this moment thinks that without a doubt, even without saying a word, the Moon King, the strongest beast tamer of this world, is a living legend. She thinks that, even without uttering a single word, he exudes greatness and holiness. Meanwhile, Su Liang can't remember her. Then he asks the girl to inform him of the course of affairs. She proclaims that according to information from their followers in the central region, recently the activity of the remnants of the Order of the Black Moon has sharply increased on the central continent. The girl reports that, moreover, it seems that they have come into close contact with the beast tamers of the Moon God's Palace. Hearing the words Order of the Black Moon Su Liang remembers something. He seems familiar with this name, and therefore he immediately runs to his cell phone. The girl does not understand what he is doing, and therefore calls him, but he asks her to stand still and be silent until he finishes. He writes in a search engine about what the Order of the Black Moon is. The Order of the Black Moon was once a lunar-type faction stationed in the northern region. Followers of the Order stole into the mystical Death Palace of the Black Moon, in which there is a certain divine power capable of painting the moon black for several days. Three years ago, the Order of the Black Moon entered into an open confrontation with the recently embarked on the path of prosperity of the teachings of the Twin Moons and was completely destroyed in one night of the full moon. Su Liang is aware of why the first owner does not remember the information about this order. It turned out that the Order of the Black Moon was such a weak teaching that the original owner did not even pay any attention to them. Without waiting for an answer from the king, the girl proclaims that he has lived for himself. The Order of the Black Moon really doesn't deserve to be bothered by him. She reports that, however, the Palace of the Moon God was also involved. For this reason, the nature of the issue has radically changed. Hearing that the Moon God Palace is involved in this matter, Su Liang freezes in place. He begins to reflect on the topic of what he should do in the future. Unlike the other second-rate factions, the Moon God Palace is the true ruler of the central continent, uniting the world with the help of legendary beasts. His reign has lasted for several thousand years, and even if over the last thousand years their dominance was gradually fading, they were still a force to be reckoned with. Therefore, it is all the more surprising that for some three years the teachings of the Twin Moons, despite the position of the palace, significantly shook its position. 
the girl proclaims that the four lunar phases intend to join together, and that's why, even if it comes to an open clash with the palace of the moon god, they can still get out of the situation without losses. The girl says that, however, with this development of events, Su Liang will remain without bodyguards. The young lady exclaims that this is why the owner sent her to him more precisely to find out his opinion and get a corresponding instruction. The guy orders her not to worry and she should go while he is in this place under the moonlight. The girl immediately charges up and happily answers him that she will fulfill his assignment. She rejoices because for the first time in her life she heard his famous saying with her own ears. She thinks that as long as the moon butterfly Morpho favors the moon king, no one in this whole world is capable of doing him the slightest harm. In her thoughts, she comes to the conclusion that he is the most dazzling moonlight. After that, she leaves the room at lightning speed through the window, leaving Su Lian alone. However, Su Liang himself is not happy with his proud speech and immediately begins to be ashamed of his 8th grader's phrase. He thinks he almost restrained himself from slapping himself. In fact, the original owner constantly threw out phrases inherent in a person with 8th grader syndrome. But each time, by some misunderstanding, they became famous sayings for his followers, even if it was outright nonsense, devoid of any meaning. The moonlight has fixed its gaze on me, I feel the presence of the moon god, while I am under the moonlight. The moonlight will rise, the moonlight will fall, the moonlight is truly bright. All of the above phrases were taken from the classic set of quotations of the moon king. And the local people were completely delighted. Su Liang becomes unwell from the fact that on the very first day since his rebirth, so many problems have piled on him at once. He thinks that although from the position of the moon king, the current moon god palace does not deserve to be worried about it. However, the prerequisites for this position are the possession of the moon butterfly Morpho, and the presence of two bodyguards, which he does not have. And if someone wants to attack him, Su Lion will have a very tragic death. But at this moment he remembers his Book of the Moon, which provides him with a reward for completing the directory. He also realizes that he visited the Moonlight Pavilion today and touched a lot of animals. The guy thinks that for sure he has accumulated at least one opportunity to extract. Su Liang opens the book and sees the inscription exchange implementation. The guy admires this outcome of events and then wants to make an exchange. He intends to pull out his reward. And at this moment, the notes about the reward system are displayed in the book. It says that there is a chance to get a beast of random rank and that after the conclusion of the contract, it will be automatically transferred to the space of tamed animals. If the beast does not match the preference of the Moon King, there is a possibility of returning and receiving compensation in the form of tamer power points. Su Liang proclaims that in other words, if he pulls out a beast that does not suit him, then he can easily terminate the contract in exchange for experience points. He thinks these are very good conditions for his current position. Su Liang decides to leave the exchange aside for now. He thinks that the most important thing for him right now is to ensure his safety, and that if suddenly he really manages to immediately pull out a beast of the highest rank, then he will have nothing to fear anymore. At this moment, he begins to pray to the great gods, saying that his life is not sugar and that he needs his help. He gets ready and still presses the exchange button. The pages of the book gradually begin to open up and Su Lion is unlocking a new beast. The number of highlighted illustrations in the directory is increasing, and the resulting beast of Su Lion turns out to be a high-rank beast named Transparent Shadow. Beast Abilities, Moon Scales and Eclipse Su Liang is surprised that the first time he uses the book, he comes across a high-rank support class beast, which also has high skills, which is very rare. The guy decides that his luck is more or less not bad. At this moment, he thinks that if he were an ordinary student of Tamer Academies, he would surely jump for joy, pulling out a rare high-ranking beast. But, alas, in his case, that is, in the case of the Moon King Su Lion, the head of the Doctrine of the Twin Moons, an insignificant transparent shadow will not be enough for him. He comes to the conclusion that the power of a high rank beast will not be able to resolve the situation in which he finds himself, and therefore, he refuses the received beast. The book registers his rejection of the contract and provides Su Lion with compensation in the form of tamer power points. At the same time, a single star of strength is added to his four star rating. Su Liang comes to the conclusion that this is a very honest compensation, and that if he pulls up his glasses just a little more, he will become a two star tamer. However, the guy thinks that even despite this, his joy has not been added to the mood in any way. He remembers with sadness that in the past, the original owner had a lot of opportunities to sign a contract with the highest ranking beasts in the domain of the Twin Moons. However, being the owner of the Moon Butterfly Morpho, he did not need it at all, therefore he did not even deign to look at them. 
Along the way, having changed into home clothes, he wonders how it all came to this. However, at this moment he stays and thinks for a couple of minutes. Su Liang thinks that even if a high-ranking beast is not able to solve the problems that have arisen, but, whatever you say, it is much stronger than his flickering butterfly, devoid of any combat capability. He thinks about the fact that if he suddenly really finds himself in some situation where the beast could be useful, then Su Liang will simply die. Then he starts to panic and wonders why he just took and refused a high-ranking beast. Su Liang suddenly realizes that perhaps his character has remained under the influence of the original owner. However, he immediately discards the idea, saying that there is still at least one difference. The guy thinks that at least he doesn't believe in all this nonsense about the Morpho Butterfly, which was composed by the original owner. Su Liang lies down on the bed, sighs heavily and returns to his thoughts again. He thinks that next time, if he manages to pull a high-ranking beast, he will still sign a contract with him. Su Liang is planning his walk to the Moonlight Pavilion tomorrow to raise more expa. The guy thinks that there are still a huge number of animals that did not get into the collection of the Book of the Moon, and that you should not forget about that snow-white disguised huntress under the mask of a doe. Closing her eyes, Su Liang ponders whether he will be able to muddy her brains if he treats her with something delicious. With such thoughts, he spends his first night in another world, in the body of the Moon King. The next day, a coup takes place in the snow-white doe's room, because of which she wakes up. When she opens her eyes, she sees that there are almost no personal belongings left in her room. Suddenly she notices a young lady in front of her who is looking after her. According to her, the precious doe is being moved to the palace of the moon god. The girl proclaims that in comparison with the local conditions, a much more luxurious life awaits her there. She also informs Lanny that the messengers of the palace of the moon god will come to her soon to take her away. The supervising girl asks the doe to obey the new caretakers and not to be naughty in any case. From hearing the news, the deer freezes on the spot and realizes that she was sold to the palace of the moon god. At this moment, two messengers of the moon god palace appear in front of the moon pavilion. To shock the employees of the pavilion, people see and begin to whisper, wondering what tamers are doing in this place. The super powerful faction of the central continent. Suddenly, one of them proclaims that she heard how the Moon King chose this place to hone his skills. Along the way, she calls this place the Promised Land. The second girl tells her not to start a conflict in any case. She proclaims that they are in this place solely for the sake of the Snow White Doe. The girl tells her that they should avoid trouble, especially related to the Moon King and the teachings of the Twin Moons. Her colleague replies to her that she already knows about all this. She asks the second girl if their job will be done if they just take the deer. The second girl answers in the affirmative. At this moment, an interesting woman is watching them outside the doors of the Moon God Pavilion, who will soon come out to them. At this moment, the head of the Moon God Pavilion named King he comes out of the front door to them. She politely greets the messengers. Two messengers greets her in response, saying the famous phrase the moon will not fall, for the night is eternal. Supervisor King he takes this for arrogance and thinks that the era of the moon god palace's dominance is now in the past. Not wanting to detain the messengers, the manager tells them that perhaps their case is urgent, and that for sure they would like to see the white doe as soon as possible. She asks them to follow her. However, the messengers refuse this privilege, saying that they have both seen enough of her photos on the internet. They proclaim that they are ready to offer a tenfold sum if they will hand it over without unnecessary delay. King he is taken aback by such a statement that they will be paid ten times the amount. The manager recalls that because of the finicky choice of a pair, snow white fallow deer are now on the verge of extinction. Therefore, despite the fact that they are medium-ranked beasts, their price is comparable to the highest-ranked beasts. King he thinks that the more the degree of preservation of their snow-white fallow deer is beyond any competition. She realizes that they have come such a long way just to offer such a high price. King he thinks it's not hard to guess that they want you to not get it and maybe take the opportunity to buy it. The messengers notice that the manager has been thinking a little and ask her what the matter is. Then the head proclaims that they should know that the pedigree of this individual comes from the animals owned by the founders of their academies. King he reports that this is why she was treated with luxury worthy of animals of the highest rank. She says that the tenfold price actually does not even compensate for the resources they have spent on it over all these years. At this moment, the tamer standing next to the friend begins to pour laughter and ironically asks the manager if she is serious about saying this. She begins to say that, they say, for sure in this pathetic backwater, no one has even seen a real beast of the highest rank. However, another tamer asks her to hold her tongue. Suddenly she announces that if necessary, they will pay them a sum of 20 times the amount. 
The tamer asks the manager if such an outcome of events will suit her, to which king he has a flame in his eyes. Suddenly, the second girl interrupts her, begins to say that the tenfold price is already too much for their budget, since it far exceeds it. She tells her not to do that. However, the second tamer thinks about something else entirely. Or rather, she thinks that her companion beast the voice of the moon belongs to the rarest representatives of high ranks that right now the voice of the moon is in a state of extreme irritation. She comes to the conclusion that it looks like something northern that she doesn't know about. However, no matter what you say, she comes to the conclusion that they are now in the possession of the palace of the moon god. She decides that they immediately need to take the snow white doe and get out of here, even if they have to make a couple more concessions regarding the price. The tamer, no matter what, decides to stand exactly on her own and waits for further instructions from the manager. Suddenly, she feels a terrible pressure, capable of wiping everything into powder. She turns away and sees that the emanating terrible aura is being released by the Moon King Su Liang himself, who is standing right behind them. The crowd standing nearby begins to wonder even more and whisper among themselves. With horror, the tamers notice that the Moon King is heading straight for them. The first tamer freezes in place and wonders why the Moon King ended up in a place like the Moonlight Pavilion. She does not understand what to do now and looks at her friend in anticipation of any reaction. However, when she looks up, she sees that her affairs are bad, since the Moon King was scurrying around and suppressed her will, so much so that she could not move. She mentally calls her friend to tell her to lower her head and not look at the Moon King. The girl still gets the message, but she is already trying to faint. The second tamer picks up with her hands a girl who faints. The girl who fainted opens her eyes and asks the other tamer if she just met the Moon King's gaze. Looking at each other, they freeze in place. A familiar shadow with the silhouette of a guy is approaching them. Suddenly, looking up, they see the Moon King standing right above them, who directs his fierce gaze at the two tamers. Both tamers lower their eyes, and they both feel this cold manner. They consider him a despot for whom everything in the world is just dust. Meanwhile, Su Liang is thinking, wondering what these two tamers from the Moon God Palace are doing in the pavilion. He becomes very interested, and he almost decides to talk to them. However, his current status is comparable to the head of the Palace of the Moon God, which is why he will not be able to talk so easily with two messengers. The messengers also think about why the Moon King does not take his eyes off them, and because of this they begin to think that the king is out of sorts. They assume their death at the hands of the Moon King. At this time, Su Liang is praying in his thoughts that at least someone will start a dialogue with him and bring him up to date. Su Liang feels that his patience is already running out. And at this moment, covering the awkward silence, the head of King He comes running. She greets him and then introduces herself as the head of the Lunar Pavilion. She proclaims that it is a great honor for her to see him with her own eyes. King He says that in truth, she has been a follower of the teachings of the Twin Moons for three months. Su Liang does not lose sight, but is glad that there was a person who decided to turn to him on his own initiative. King He also introduces the two tamers to him, saying that they are the messengers of the Moon God Palace who came to buy a medium rank beast. She also reports that we are talking about a snow white fallow deer, which he saw with his own eyes yesterday. The manager says that since her condition exceeds beyond measure, they offered an exorbitant price for her. Then Su Liang remembers that Moon Huntress who disguised herself as a Snow White Doe. He wonders if no one but him knows that she is actually a disguised hunter in the body of a beast. The reason why they almost blew the dust off her is that, in their opinion, her ancestry is connected with her ancestors. At this moment, he realizes that she is not the kind of creature that money can buy. Su Liang decides that he will not be able to let the pavilion just sell a beast of the highest rank to the palace of the moon god, and so he goes in the direction of the manager. The tamer's hearts begin to subside slowly, and they come to the conclusion that perhaps the moon king has finally retired and spared them. And the next second, Su Liang tells them to come back and along the way says that they should not have come here at all. Finally, he says a phrase that shocks everyone at once. The moon will soon fall. The manager thinks for a second about where the moon is coming from here, if it's day. However, then the meaning of the above words comes to her. The manager thinks that if an ordinary person had said this phrase, it would most likely have been considered meaningless. However, the person who uttered it was the moon king, known as the strongest in this world. King he thinks that then the hidden meaning of this phrase addressed to the palace of the moon god lies in the fact that the palace of the moon god may be facing an unprecedented disaster. Then one of the tamers tells him in a quiet and trembling voice that the moon will not fall. The crowd is surprised that she dared to survive the moon king. Then Su Liang looks at her fiercely and leaves the tamer in silence on her lap. The girl falls, faints again, and is picked up again by another tamer. She thinks they'll have to forget about the snow deer for now. 
she comes to the conclusion that the solution to the situation that has arisen is already far beyond their capabilities. She picks up the tamer, who has fainted, and grabs her by the shoulder. They both leave the scene and, as they leave, she thinks, they need to return to the palace immediately and convey the words of the Moon King to the Ten Pillars. As she leaves, she reflects on the words of the Moon King and feels that disaster is coming. They leave the Moon God Pavilion in disgrace. King He also looks after them and says goodbye to them. The manager looks after them and is amazed at the impudent words of one of the tamers. Following them with her eyes, in her thoughts she remembers the phrase one of the tamers. I told the moon king, the moon will not fall, for the night is eternal. She wonders if the dim light of their moon should have been extinguished long ago. Kai he thinks that the true light of the moon sleeps tirelessly in the eyes of the moon king Su Lian. Su Liang enters the pavilion at this moment and immediately grabs his heart. He sighs with relief and says that it was a very dangerous trick on his part. He thinks he's lucky that the younger messenger started stuttering and didn't finish her sentence. He proclaims that otherwise he would have no idea how to get out of this situation. Su Liang proclaims that he will not be able to say for sure whether he has betrayed himself or not. However, after all that has been said, it is unlikely that the palace of the moon god will again think of taking over the Snow White Doe. Meanwhile, in the Snow White Doe's room, the rearrangement of things begins. All the employees start sorting through the Doe's things into boxes and go to the entrance. Then one of their employees begins to approach the White Doe's bed and take her bed. She bites her robe with her teeth and furiously asks her not to touch her things. Of course, the employees in the room do not understand her language. They do not understand why she behaves so capriciously on this day, and remind her, because the rest of the days she was obedient. Then one of the main employees, who has been looking after her all this time, proclaims that she probably cannot bear the thought of parting with mommy, and to be more precise with her, she immediately goes to the deer and hugging her, prepares for her that she should not worry so much. She informs her that when the doe is in the palace of the moon god, mommy will still visit her often. The doe responds to her in her own language that she will do without such luxuries, so she asks her to be a good girl while she cleans up here. The employee goes to Lanny's bed and opens her bed. There she sees a lot of girly things that definitely shouldn't be on the beast's bed. There it turns out, a pink mirror, a doll, a love manga and a phone. The caretaker is shocked and does not understand where such things came from on the doe's bed. She wonders if such things really attract pet animals. She picks up the phone in the hope of understanding whose it is. The caretaker suggests that perhaps someone dropped it in this place. Seeing this, the doe begins to get nervous and remembers that her browser history is open which the caretaker can catch. She decides that she would rather go to the dark side than let her browser history be revealed. And therefore, having stuck her horns, she resorts directly to the caretaker from behind. Then she falls on the bed. Meanwhile, her phone flies straight to the hands of the Moon King Su Lion, who just appeared on the doorstep to look at the state of the deer. At this moment, the Snow White Doe captures the heart. Everyone turns to the door, where the king stands lost in the face. In his hands he has a pink phone with an open browser. Seeing that the phone is in his hands, the doe wonders why he caught her phone as luck would have it, and even with the browser open. Su Liang starts looking at the phone and sees that it's whose browser history is open. One by one, he starts reading her requests, and bursting into laughter more and more. When she sees that he is laughing and that realizing that she will not be able to take the phone away, she hides behind her bed in embarrassment and all the employees who collected her things abruptly fall silent in their seats and without taking their eyes off, look directly at the Moon King. The guy clicks on one request and sees that this novel is about a tyrant beast. He is very amused by the lines from this novel. He sees an interesting phrase. You've managed to interest me, young lady. He ironically wonders if he should say this to the Snow White Doe. Putting the phone aside, he suddenly announces, the deal with the palace of the moon god has been cancelled and that they can part ways. He says that later the twin moons doctrine will send a representative to negotiate the acquisition of the moonlight pavilion. The staff does not understand what he is talking about and ask the king about whether the teaching of the twin moons will buy their pavilion. The guy thinks that he originally came here for this reason. Su Liang thinks that after all, the cover in the form of a moonlight pavilion will give him an excuse to touch a lot of lunar type beasts. He thinks that no one will be surprised by the desire of the pavilion owner to expand his collection. He thinks that now it's time for him to return to the situation with the public disgrace of one beast of the highest rank. For security reasons, he still decides to make a tactical retreat and then it just disappears. The crowd begins to wonder more and more about such an appearance and such a disappearance of the Moon King. They are also surprised that, out of the blue, the Moon King has announced that their deal has been cancelled. They don't understand what just happened in front of him. 
They wonder if he has met with the messengers of the Palace of the Moon God. Some say that the deal was cancelled unilaterally, and others proclaim that there were no compromises in this deal, and they believe that the Moon King is, as always, in his repertoire. However, one girl from the crowd stops their stormy reflections and asks them if this means that the Palace of the Moon God has been publicly declared war. She proclaims that now they will undoubtedly find themselves under the patronage of the teachings of the Twin Moons. Then the head caretaker gets out of bed and says that she is more haunted by that phone. She asks the crowd if they saw the expressions on the Moon King's face when he was in his hands, and it becomes incredibly curious what he saw there. At the same moment, an enraged doe comes out from under his bed. He grabs the phone from the ground. She immediately goes headlong to the door and quickly exits it. The head caretaker exclaims to her not to run so headlong, and asks her if this is not the consequences of a rebellious period. The Snow White Doe immediately aspires to the Moon King. Walking quickly through each corridor of the Lunar Pavilion, she thinks that the Moon King knows not only who she really is, but also that he has seen her browser history. Finally, wandering through the corridors, she finally notices the Moon King running around. She decides she won't let him leave the pavilion. The huntress in Danny's body thinks that otherwise she can only move to another planet. Burning with shame, she orders the Moon King to stop immediately. She immediately asks him if he has seen her entire browser history. Headlong, she gets into a threatening position, thereby showing him who is in charge here. The guy stops and, since he hears her human voice for the first time, concludes that she is still a girl. He thinks that explains her choice of short stories. The Doe proclaims that if he dares to give someone her secret, she will not just leave it. Su Liang gets stuck in silence for a minute. At this moment, the Huntress wonders if she managed to make him afraid of her threats, and he looks at the guy questioningly, threateningly. At this moment, Su Liang still decides to speak and makes the most serene face that he has. He tells the Huntress not to worry, because, according to him, sometimes public shame becomes a great incentive to quickly discard the past version of yourself. From such impudence and rudeness, the Huntress in the body of a Snow White Doe melts on the spot and almost faints. She does not understand why the king decided to make such a sharp joke on her. You managed to interest me, young lady. With these words, the Moon King Su Liang begins to tease the Huntress. He watches with delight her violent reaction. She starts blushing like a tomato from the very first words he says and asks him to be silent, and also not to say anything about it. She still decides to win a little more so as not to lose her pride. With such intentions, she tells him not to think that since he is the king, she will not do anything to him. The Huntress proclaims that if she finds out that he told someone about her or said those phrases, then he will be very severely punished at her hands. She says that at the same moment she will break out of the Moonlight Pavilion and immediately come to his house, and then trample him to death, and that his blood would be flying at that moment. The guy thinks a little and, staring at the Huntress, remembers that animals of the highest rank have a special sixth sense. He thinks that if, being in a certain radius, he calls them using their real name, they will instantly feel it and then they will immediately come. Finally, Su Liang decides to speak, and he asks the Huntress that, to put it in other words, if he calls her while she is nearby, she will instantly find herself next to him. The Huntress, without knowing why, immediately answers in the affirmative. After her long-awaited answer, she regains consciousness and does not understand why she just blurted it out. She also doesn't understand what he's talking about. Suddenly, the guy with the friendliest tone exclaims, if he calls her and she does not show up in response, then he will tell everyone her secret. It is not clear why. From this, the Huntress begins to blush even more and be embarrassed. After that, she says that she will appear if she is called. This ends their dialogue and the Moon King proclaims that it's time for him to leave. He asks her to remember their agreement always. However, at this moment the Huntress asks him to stop and listen to her. The guy stops for a moment and looks questioningly at the White Doe. She is at this moment trying to remember one phrase for him. Beware of the full moon. Without paying much attention, the guy simply answers the Huntress in the affirmative and walks away from the pavilion of the Lunar Palace. As soon as Su Liang leaves, she remembers his words that she should be in front of him as soon as he calls her. She thinks that these words are too similar, a roundabout confession, which is very common in episodes with random encounters, in novels about tyrants. In any case, she follows him with her eyes and goes back to her room. At this time, Su Liang resorts to the exit of the pavilion and begins to wonder at his bravery. He doesn't understand how he managed to intimidate a beast of the highest rank. 
At this moment, he thinks that to tell the truth, she looked so funny in his eyes that he wanted to tease her a little more. He realizes that in the end he automatically gave out that strange phrase from her novel. Su Liang thinks that after all, according to the foundations of this world, in the case of a contract between a beast tamer and a pet animal, they stay with each other until death. And not to say that this is very different from a marriage proposal. Su Liang comes to the conclusion that if he really brings her anger on himself, then it is possible that his life will end there. He thinks this proves that she is very concerned about the prospect of social death. Su Liang decides, whatever you say, a funny incident happened to them. However, at this moment he remembers her last phrase that he should beware of the full moon which takes him by surprise. He doesn't understand why she said that and what she meant. Su Liang thinks that besides, it seems somewhat strange to give such a warning to a person known as the Moon King. He assumes that, perhaps, in three days, on the night of the full moon, something very bad will happen that he or they do not foresee. At this moment, he activates the Book of the Moon and, opening it, immediately sees his level. He sees that there are no bodyguards around him right now to protect him if he gets into some kind of danger. In general, just in case, he decides that he urgently needs to strengthen his combat staff. At this moment, exactly on the night of the full moon, a meeting takes place in the main hall of the Moon God Palace, where ten princesses, pillars of the Moon God Palace gather and make a decision. Ten beast tamers standing at the top of the hierarchies of the Moon God Palace. Their true identities are unknown, however, according to rumors, they are all, as one, girls of exceptionally unearthly beauty. Two messengers come and deliver Su Lion's words exactly exactly. The moon will soon fall. One of the ten beast tamers asks the messengers if the Moon King really said such a thing. The messengers immediately answer in the affirmative. The fourth princess proclaims that his words really made her remember something to remember. She proclaims that at the last walls of the season, the time of the full moon was different. She warns them not to forget to adjust their watches accordingly. In response to her, the other princesses start spitting her dirt, saying that she needs to adjust her brains. She doesn't understand why the crowd is mad at her and asks the crowd what she did wrong. She resents the fact that everyone is so angry at her. They say she's too smug and that she's not right in the head. Suddenly one of them says that all this is not good. She proclaims that Lunar is not the kind of person who will get close to low rank beasts. The girl believes that this does not correspond to his image of the Moon King. She says that his appearance in the Moonlight Pavilion completely goes against common sense. The girl exclaims that this is why she believes that something must and must be present in the Moonlight Pavilion that has managed to attract the attention of the Moon King. She proclaims that with great probability, the one who attracted his attention was most likely the Moonlight Emperor. The crowd begins to whisper among themselves and begins to make a fuss about the latest rumor. The messengers also begin to look at each other. Finally, one girl asks the so-called chapter. She's talking about the Emperor. She proclaims that if the Moon King manages to subdue a being of Imperial rank, it will prove that there is a divine spirit in the body of the Moon King. One by one, a crowd of princesses joins one girl's words about the Moon King. The girl continues her speech and says that it is very likely that the divine spirit of the Moon King will awaken soon. She proclaims that if the miracle of awakening happens when the palace of the Moon God loses all opportunity to compete with other palaces. Suddenly, when the meeting of the princesses ends, the fourth princess, whom everyone disliked, decides to help the Order of the Black Moon. People from the Order of the Black Moon ask if she decided to help them after all. In response, there is her counter question about what will happen if it turns out that the Moon King has signed a contract with the Imperial Beast. She also asks them if they think they still have a chance of defeating him, if they have such chances. People from the Order of the Black Moon do not believe their ears and start asking the princess again and again, saying that she may have made a mistake. But after making sure that she is not lying, they fall silent for a minute. Then, standing at the other end of the tube, she asks them what they eventually took. Finally, there is an answer from another member of the Black Order. The guy assures her not to worry, because, according to him, the Moon King is not the only person in this world who is favored by the Moon. The fourth princess is surprised by such a bold statement. Over the past few days, after the Moon King acquired the Moonlight Pavilion, the followers of the Twin Moons Doctrine began to search for moon-type beasts everywhere and deliver them to the Tamer Academy. One by one, the beasts from all lands go straight to the Moonlight Pavilion. All this hype has thrown the entire northern region into panic. Each faction trembled with fear and forgot about sleep. Someone believed that the Moon King's way to increase his strength was to devour small animals alive to raise energy. There were even rumors that everything that was happening was nothing more than signs of the awakening of the divine spirit hidden in the body of the Moon King. In view of all sorts of guesses, a rather tense situation has arisen in the northern region. 
everyone believed that he was in danger. As for the person who was in the epicenter of this storm, or rather the Moon King Su Lion, he still collected animals in the directory. By exchanging the collected points for a beast, five animals are unlocked, of which only the fifth turns out to be a sweaty high-ranking beast. The five mentioned five beasts include low-rank moon elements, low-rank moon spirit bird, medium-type moon crossing, medium-rank moon sickle leopard, and finally, high-rank opera month. Analyzing what he came across, Su Liang proclaims that at that time he managed to pull out a high-rank beast with one attempt, and now he got one only on the fifth attempt. Su Liang understands that three days is too short a time, even with the help of the teachings of the twin moons. Accumulating five attempts was not an easy task for him. The guy comes to the conclusion that there is no point in signing a contract with low-ranked and medium-ranked beasts. He believes that the only benefit from them is that the tamer's power and replenishment of the collection of the Book of the Moon are in the glasses. As for the high-ranked beast, the Moon King had previously said that if he pulled out a high-ranked beast, he would sign a contract with it. However, this time, as he understood, Lake Month belongs to the support class. He feels that he has a feeling that this beast will not help him in any way. Moreover, the name of this beast is missing from the memories of the previous owner. Therefore, he believes that for sure this beast belongs to some niche group. Still, to begin with, to check it out, he decides to go online and find information about this beast. Having written the settings of the name of the beast at his request, nothing comes out. Su Liang comes to a surprise that in their days there are still animals that have not been included in the encyclopedia. However, the guy remembers that since he has already opened it, he will be able to see the related information in the lunar book given to him. Information about the lake month comes out. It turns out that this anomalous beast was discovered once in 13,000 years ago and included in the list of the lunar book due to the lack of reproduction functions. The genus is considered completely extinct, and there is no information about the ancestors. Combat skill, immersion. A special innate skill that allows you to absorb all shock pulses and wave vibrations at close range. Reaching the limit leads to the rupture of the body and the death of the lake month. Note, after a certain time, the pet animal that has signed a contract with the tamer is resurrected. This is also one of the reasons why relatively weak people were able to coexist with the beasts. After seeing all this information about a high-ranking beast, Su Liang is thrilled on the spot. He wonders if the lake month appeared before the appearance of the moon god's palace. He realizes that the lake month is the progenitor of the beast. Now he understands the reason why there is no information about him on the internet. The lake month turns out to be a creature not even from the current era. At this very moment, one of the most brilliant ideas is emerging in his head. The main reason for his reluctance to enter into contracts with other high-ranking beasts is that he is afraid that others may find out about it. Say what you will, but high-ranking beasts do not correspond at all to a person who has the status of the strongest king in the world, a beast tamer. However, what if we are talking about an unknown beast of high rank? Since the Lake Month clan died out a long time ago, no one will discover its true rank. Moreover, his ability will be very useful in overcoming the sudden coming crisis. In addition, his presence is difficult to detect and he lacks combat capability. However, it is quite suitable for the current situation. After a short thought, Su Liang decides that it is more profitable for him to sign a contract with Lake Month, since there are advantages everywhere. He signs a contract with Lake Month. After that, at the same moment, another creature besides the Moon Butterfly Morpho comes into Su Lian's consciousness in the space of the companion beasts. After signing the contract, Su Liang feels the fusion of his and Lake Month. He feels a mystical sensation emanating from him, radically different from the characteristic features of other high-ranking beasts. Su Liang now has a second companion beast. He hopes that in the future he will be able to provide him with the necessary help. In addition, a full moon is coming, in which, in theory, his powers should be doubled. On the night of the full moon, there is a security guard on the roof of a tall house who has been assigned this area. He wonders why he was given to guard this part of the city. It turns out that according to the secret information received from the temple of the moon god, he moved to this world. So this full moon of the moon sometimes will not be idle either. The guard turns out to be one of the strongest members of the order, and that this time he perfectly managed to infiltrate the academy. However, he is still warned to be extremely careful and keep an eye out. The area in which it is located is closest to the Moon King, and if he shows even a drop of hostile intentions, intentions, then it will be detected immediately. Then he is instantly involved in failure. Suddenly, a huge and white rabbit appears behind him, which he does not notice. Meanwhile, in Su Liang's room, his shimmering Morpho butterfly begins to go outside under some special influence of the moon. 
Su Liang notices this and does not understand why she does this if she has never behaved like this on the previous full moon. The lake moon is sleeping soundly at the moment, and nothing strange is happening to it. Su Liang believes that, most likely, an extremely strong beast has appeared on the territory of the academy causing panic to low-ranking pet animals. Su Liang goes after the Morpho butterfly, and he assures her that he will not go outside with her to find out the cause of her unexplained anxiety. In the academy there is a ban on movement at night, but for the Moon King, it does not matter much. Su Liang comes to the conclusion that since something strange has arisen on the territory of the academy, it is more or less related to him. He thinks that if he is in danger, he would rather meet her in an open area than in a closed dorm room. Su Liang comes to the conclusion that besides, he will not involve other students in this. Going out into the corridor, he sees that there is complete chaos going on there. All the low-ranked animals suddenly seem to have gone mad as one. They all gather in a crowd and run to the exit. Su Liang freezes in place, not understanding what is going on in this place. At this moment, he realizes that it turns out that the predictions of the Moon Huntress really came true. He assumes that an unknown wild beast has made its way to this place, which is looking for him. However, at this moment, there is suddenly a significant rumble on the street. Su Liang goes to the window and sees that a standing guard is being attacked by a huge and angry white rabbit of obviously low rank. He sighs with relief, because after all, they did not come for his head, but for some other reason. A reason that no one knows about yet. Su Liang also sees that the guard clearly needs help. The rabbit begins to walk the streets and destroy houses. He screams and starts chasing the guard. The guard is just approaching to attack him from behind, when a huge rabbit tail immediately flies to him. At the speed of light, he flies away into the distance and lands in one of the houses, simultaneously crushing him with his fall. Meanwhile, in the dormitory, all low-ranked animals begin to panic, thereby disturbing not only themselves, but also their owners. Su Liang is very curious about what is happening outside. All the animals in the Moonlight Pavilion as one go to the room of the Snow White Fallow Deer. All of them in a panic resort to it, after which they hear a shout in their direction. They all freeze, waiting for an answer from her. She wonders why they all made noise in the middle of the night. The Huntress proclaims that everyone has got her and tells them all to go to bed immediately. The poor low-ranked beasts, without even objecting to her, all as one crowd subside and obediently return to themselves. The pavilion staff notice that after visiting the Snow White Doe's room, for some reason they all instantly calm down. Meanwhile, the Huntress, who seemed harsh at first glance, begins to blush and think about what the Moon King meant then. Superfluous thoughts begin to climb to her, from which she begins to blush, blush even more. However, she stops and thinks that after all, he is on the same level as the Lord of the Cold Moon. She wonders why he needs her and, most importantly, why he should summon her. However, she thinks that if suddenly his strength, it is possible that his strength will actually reach the true peak. Then maybe she can really be useful to him. Superfluous thoughts about the guy begin to climb into her head again and with a red face like a tomato, she begins to lean around her bed. She wonders if it's possible that he will actually say her name tonight. At this time, complete chaos is happening on the streets of the city, where an angry rabbit destroys everything that gets in his way. Suddenly, a ferocious rabbit sees a guard flying to the other end of the city in front of him. He stands on two huge moonfish and hangs over him, as if showing his superiority. The guard asks the rabbit about where he got such abnormal power. He proclaims that he is much stronger than he imagined. However, the man proclaims that since he dared to repair the ruin of academies, he clearly does not belong to the teachings of the Twin Moons. He says that in the end, if the Moon King himself had sent him after him, then he initially had no chance to resist. The guard exclaims that, apparently, the rabbit is just an animal that has gone wild under the moonlight, which he was needlessly afraid of. The rabbit doesn't seem to understand what he's talking about. He looks dumbfounded at the guard, not understanding what he means. Suddenly, the guard asks the giant a question. He asks him if he knows that this is the territory of the Moon King. He proclaims that if his peace is disturbed, they can both lose their lives. The man exclaims that even if he is a strong healthy man, he should get out of here as soon as possible. It is not known whether he understood what the guard said. But the next second the giant rabbit finally loses his head and throws pieces of stones at the higher guard. He immediately hides behind his moonfish, from which he manages to avoid serious injuries and damage. All the damage that the moonfish received instantly heals, after which the guard praises their such good work and rapid regeneration. At this moment, looking at the giant rabbit, the guard thinks that despite the terrifying power, the rabbit seems to be completely unwilling and does not resemble high-ranking animals with intelligence at all. 
He also thinks that the rabbit especially cannot belong to the highest rank, otherwise his moonfish would not be able to restrain his attack. The guard exclaims that he is interested in finding out what kind of doe he is, since he dared to disturb the moon king in such a rude way. After these words, the guard jumps out of two moon fish. After that, the man announces that he removes the restrictions and that the fish are given permission to absorb moonlight. Following the words of the guard, two moon fish, which are called floating moon, join and after which a huge black and more powerful fish comes out of them. After the two fish merge, the hunter gives an order that they need to immediately stop absorbing the energies of the moon. Puffing and holding onto his heart, he almost reaches his limit. Since apart from the Lord of the Cold Moon and the Lunar Palace, there are no people capable of absorbing moonlight in unlimited quantities. Exceeding the limit for the guard may well be the cause of death. As for the Moon King, his existence has long been beyond the bounds of common sense. The man thinks that whatever it was, his abilities are more than enough to cope with a giant rabbit. At this very moment, he is closely watching the giant. He proclaims that since he became an abnormal mentor, he still has never had to fight at full strength, as he is doing now. Approaching the rabbit, the guard proclaims that this night will be exceptional for him. The man exclaims that the rabbit is not the only animal that can become a mad monster under the moon. At this moment, he raises his right hand, thereby directing his companion beast directly at the enemy. A huge fish with huge sharp teeth comes out against a ferocious giant rabbit. Meanwhile, in the dormitory of the Moon Tamer Academies, the route and relocation begins. All students who have a low-ranked beast and not only are let out because of a sudden attack on the city. Students are being evacuated and asked not to stay. The caretakers tell the students to be extremely careful. One of the teachers asks the other if their academy has been attacked by a hostile faction. The other one answers her that this is not possible, since the Moon King himself lives in this academy. She proclaims that perhaps just some beast has fallen into a rage because of the full moon. Then the first one repeatedly proclaims that, after all, on the night of the full moon, lunar-type animals become unusually dangerous. The teacher also says that in this state they are able to defeat even abnormal mentors. And at the same moment, Su Liang flies past them like a bullet. Then they try to stop the moon king. However, when she sees his face, the teacher freezes in place. Suddenly the guy says that soon the moon will rise. And then he just takes it and leaves, leaving the teacher with her mouth agape. She, seeing that this is the Moon King, decides not to contradict him and just leaves. Su Liang hurriedly goes to the battlefield. Along the way, he thinks that despite the fact that he has only the Lake Month at his disposal against the impending threat, for some reason, a feeling of hard-to-explain self-confidence reigned in his heart all the time. And therefore, under such a full and crazy moon, this strange feeling only intensified. He thinks that speaking in the language of the original owner, this feeling can perhaps be described as the moon favors me.